Hello, everybody, and welcome to Source Material, a podcast about adaptation, where we take a book or a famous piece of literature and compare it to its film or television adaptation. My name is Russell Lobsher. Oh, and this, this is where I say my name. Is that Probably. what's going to happen? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm Zach Kay. Nice, nice to have you all here. Yeah, and this is a podcast that's going to tell you that if you just focus real hard for a couple of years, life can be sweet. All right, Zach, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, we, we played some soccer earlier today and uh, did not have a favorable outcome, but it was it was fun to be out there and run around with the lads. So how about yourself? Uh, that's good. Uh, not so bad. It's like very, not very early in the morning, but it is in the morning. So I have just woken up here in South Africa. Um, but I'm well, a little stressed. South Africa plays quarterfinal match in the Rugby World Cup later this evening against the uh, one of the France. So we'll see, see how that goes. Um, the, uh, the entire country is on the edge, but in a good way. We're excited for the matchup. So, yeah. Sure. It's, it's a youth stress instead of a distress. For sure. Yes. How was the, uh, the, the card playing last night? I understand that you went and played some poker. Uh, yeah, that was just, uh, it was a couple hours ago. It was fun. It was a very casual, like, you know, cash game, $10 buy-in, just hanging out with folks mainly. But it was fun. Yeah. I, I ended yeah. up down 85 cents. Oh. Well, uh, not some, not a significant losses. Yeah, we're going to have to be consistent with uh, our references to time here, since though your evening at the moment is my yesterday, so... Uh, I'll try to be better right. and make a little bit about that, but yeah, that's, uh, no that's doubt, okay. no doubt, you wouldn't have uh, lost eighty-five cents. Perhaps been ahead, were you able to have seen through the back of the cards? Well, let's take that as an opportunity to introduce our first book that we're going to be discussing, and that is the short story, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar, and six more. Though we won't be talking about the other six, by Raul Dahl. Recently adapted by Wes Anderson, currently playing on Netflix. Um, so, Zach, I guess before we get into any bi- biographical information about either Wes or Rawls, I'd like to know your history with these two um, creators. Sure. Uh, I guess I was introduced to Roald Dahl uh, at a young age. I, I read some, a few to a handful of his books and stories in probably elementary school, like James and the Giant Peach, uh, the BFG, Matilda, right? It's a real doll story. Um, so it's kind of someone that was present in my my early childhood exploration into literature, and then maybe not as much uh, as I've aged and been an adult. Um, whereas it's probably the opposite for Wes Anderson, which I guess makes sense time wise uh, but I've seen a handful of his movies I generally enjoy them but I don't tend to to love them the same way that people who are really Wes Anderson fans do so. yeah I think that's that's fair he's got a, a fairly unique style I would say one of the rare uh, auteurs in contemporary filmmaking who if you see his work, it's quite easy to distinguish his work from the rest, even for the casual film observer, I would say. And as of late, definitely. he's definitely, he's definitely uh, really embraced his, uh, his style. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so Raul Dahl, uh, as you already outlined, yeah, beloved children's author. He's uh, British, born in uh, Landaff, Cardiff, in, on the 13th of September, 1916. Passed away on the 23rd of November, 1990, so approximately 33 years ago, uh, shortly before we were born. Uh, but the staying power of his books, I think, is remarkable. You know, you mentioned how you had uh, really, you know, come into his stories as a child, uh, as an English teacher of 11 through 14-year-old. Would I'm shocked to see that his books still have a lot of staying power with them. Um, they they are adored. The BFG, Matilda, Fantastic Mr. Fox, The Twits, The Witches, all of these uh, stories that we experienced growing up uh, are still loved by kids today. Um, so he is he, he yeah. is uh, remarkable, I suppose, in that way. However, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar was never one that was on my radar as a child. I think it took until doing this with you, or actually the announcement of Wes Anderson's 
adaptation for me to even realize that, that was a Roald Dahl story. Was that the same for you? Yeah, I'd never heard of it before um, until you mentioned it to me as one of the new Wes Anderson movies that's coming out. And before I, I guess, you know, we kind of let's talk about the story. What did you think of the, the reading the story, the book? Did it sort of bring back this nostalgic experience of engaging with Roald Dahl's uh, form previous works? Or did you kind of feel like you were experiencing it fresh? I think I kind of felt like I was experiencing it fresh, uh, if only because it had been so long since I'd read any of his other work that uh, I didn't necessarily have the like stylistic memory or even, I guess, as a child reading his books, the capacity to understand and consider style in literature writing. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Was that kind of the same for you? Yeah, it was. I did. However, you know, I don't know if it was just me recognizing that it was a raw doll story that I was put into a mindset to like reflect on the the warmth uh, that I felt as a child reading stories like, you know, the twits and Charlie and the chocolate factory. But I, I would say that I enjoyed my reading experience uh, as a whole. I wouldn't say there, are, I think that there are issues I have with the story, which we'll get to, I'm sure. But um, as a whole, mm-hmm. the, the reading and engaging with the story was, was pleasant. I read it on a plane uh, and had a, had a great time for those that two hour duration of life. Yeah, I, I agree. It was something that I'm glad to have read, uh, but also maybe not uh, my favorite piece of literature that I've ever read. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure that that's a it's a high bar. You know, maybe they'll do an adaptation of House of Leaves. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, so let's jump into the story. So, uh, I have my copy out in front of me and starts off like this. Henry Sugar was 41 years old and unmarried. He was also wealthy. He was wealthy because he had a rich father who was now dead. He was unmarried because he was too selfish to share any of his money with a wife. He was six feet, two inches tall, but he wasn't really as good looking as he thought he was. He paid a great deal of attention to his clothes. He went to an expensive tailor for his suits, to a shirt maker for his shirts, and to a boot maker for his shoes. He used a costly aftershave on his face, and he kept his hands soft with a cream that contained turtle oil. His hairdresser trimmed his hair once every ten days, and he always took a manicure at the same time. His upper front teeth had been capped at incredible expense because the originals had had a rather nasty, yellowish tinge. A small mole had been removed from his left cheek by a plastic surgeon. He drove a Ferrari car that must have cost him about the same as a country cottage. Skipping ahead a little bit, says Henry had never done a day's work in his life, and his personal motto, which he had invented himself, was this, it is better to incur a mild rebuke than to perform an onerous task. His friends thought this was hilarious. Men like Henry Sugar are to be found drifting like seaweed all over the world. And then a little bit further, all of them, all wealthy people of this type, have one peculiarity in common. They have a terrific urge to make themselves still wealthier than they already are. The million is never enough, nor is the two million. Always, they have this insatiable longing to get more money, and that is because they live in constant terror of waking up one morning and finding there's nothing in the bank. So with this, you know, when I first, you know, read this section of the story, I was like, okay, I can see why Wes Anderson has chosen this story. You know, I definitely think that there's some commentary that he's maybe trying to suggest with like the enormous wealth gap that we see in the world um did that sort of resonate for you a little bit it seems it's quite like how could it not you know kind of given the that that is our first introduction to this character that we're going to be spending 70 odd pages with totally um although i i disagree that we spend 70 pages with this character uh yeah. because a large chunk of that is a different story essentially um but yeah, and this is a trend that we're seeing all across filmmaking or any sort of art media creation right now is like, we're criticizing the rich right now. It's kind of what's going on. It's very topical. It's very of the zeitgeist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you for correcting me there. You know, obviously, uh, I think one of the main draws that Wes had to this story was the fact that it is uh, multiple stories embedded within one another. Uh, that mm-hmm. that has been reflected in some of his more recent films as well. But do you want to give us a breakdown of what the the complete story 
the wonderful story of Henry Sugar is about? Um, sure. Essentially, Henry Sugar is off cavorting with his other wealthy friends. He It's his turn to sit out of the card game, so he wanders around into a library, which he normally wouldn't be interested in because he only reads detective or mystery thrillers, probably similar to The Firm by John Grisham um, yeah. or, or of the time. Uh, but he finds this notebook by, written by a doctor in India who is telling the story of someone he meets who has acquired the ability to see without his eyes. And I won't synopse the whole thing in case you would want to read the book or watch the movie, but Henry Sugar then decides to learn that for himself and uses it in order to cheat casinos to donate money to uh, a new shell corp in Sweden or uh, Switzerland that he then uses to set up orphanages, essentially. Yeah. Um, what what part of the story did you find the most enjoyable to read? Because as you say, like, we are introduced to this character, Henry Sugar, who's, you know, clearly somebody that's supposed to be uh, not by any means uh, a sympathetic character, at least at the beginning. And then we sort of dive into this reading of uh, this Indian doctor's account of the story that he's uh, of this man that he had met and uh, this uh, amazing talent that he had possessed. Yeah, I found, to me, the best part, the most fun I had reading this was reading about Henry Sugar's character transformation, which is, I mean, the crux of all storytelling, right, is his character growth. But the way he focused on learning this talent for two or three years and then emerged a totally different person and the process of seeing him realize that about himself was just joyful it was a joyful moment in in a story do you, is that uh is that your take as well do you have another favorite i think so i, I you know i i definitely agree that seeing that transformation with henry sugar was in, in, enjoyable it was uh fun to see that like he had become so committed to this idea at, at, at the outset at least it was like okay how can i use this for personal gain right but then through like the hard work and the attention that he had given to this task he had himself sort of transformed into someone who that didn't matter anymore right somebody who believed that that just wasn't his his primary objective with his life and so that that was that wasn't rewarding to see i do think that with that i i had some issues with like what the story is really trying to say which might be that like hey you know if really wealthy people were just more philanthropic, we'd be good, you know? Um, I don't know if you butted up against that at, at all. Yeah, cool. as an overarching uh, sociopolitical commentary that is obviously flawed and oversimplified. So, yes, uh, it's also a short story and not necessarily like a... a novel length thesis on uh, a theme so I, I guess i focused more on the personal transformation of henry sugar finding fulfillment in something other than the meaningless acquisition of wealth fair enough yeah i mean again as i said it was a very it was a pleasant story but sort of like thinking about how it's been adapted to kind of suit our like you know current social mm -hmm. political times um it was something that i struggled to kind of keep out of my mind you know sure I, yeah and and i think that's probably more fair uh as a criticism to the like the wes anderson adaptation right than the original short story fair so maybe we should jump into that um you had mentioned before that sort of wes anderson was somebody that whose uh films you had in watched in the past i myself have watched 10 of his 11 feature films the one that's missing wow. was the darjeeling limited which would have probably come in handy given that my understanding is much of it is set in India, um, but unfortunately, yeah, that's the the one omission from his filmography. Um, how about you? What is what is your favorite uh, of his films, or one that you particularly? So, I've seen 
Fantastic Mr. Fox, um, bits and pieces of uh, the Darjeeling Limited and Grand Budapest Hotel and probably one or two others of his. Um, and to me, my favorite is the Grand Budapest Hotel. I, I think that's a very delightful story. It, even if it's not... I, I have issues with it as a story, but the film is delightful and enjoyable to watch does that make sense absolutely yeah i also think that it's it's probably the the height of his popularity i think amongst Mm. uh, like just casual film goers it was the film that i think he had the most sort of recognition in regards to being nominated for the academy award for best picture right and um, it was definitely uh, i think his most commercially successful film at least um with regards to his, uh, yeah, because uh, I, I think that what we see with Wes Anderson is he feels like an indie filmmaker that has like a like big budget commercial success, right? Which is quite sure. rare. Um, in fact, I would say that there are probably less than fewer than ten directors currently who could hold uh, a similar position in current film. In who film. who else do you think uh, qualifies under that? Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. I think he he another Anderson. Funny enough, mm-hmm. I think uh, <laughs> I think that uh, Greta Gerwig, although she has recently made a movie that's grossed over a billion dollars based off of IP, had a similar sort of appeal. Right? If somebody knew that there was a Greta Gerwig film coming out, despite whatever, despite the subject matter, I think people would be drawn to going to see it. Um, sure. Beyond that, Jordan Peele, I think as a similar uh, draw attached to his his name being associated with the film. Uh Then I think you can go back into some of these, you know, well-established auteurs like Quentin Tarantino, Juan Scorsese, you know, folks that have had a long, well, you know, storied career on, but uh, making multiple films, you know, but have their unique style. I think Quentin Tarantino is probably the epitome of this idea that I'm getting at. Certainly has has his own very unique style, yeah. Um, I would maybe toss, and this is my own personal uh, preferences, but I would toss Ryan Johnson into that discussion as well. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Tell me. Tell me more. I know that you're a Johnson head. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, his filmography is a pretty broad range of genres i guess right like you've got the the knives out and glass onion detective mysteries uh brick is kind of a detective mystery but it feels totally different right it's very noir it's neo-noir as opposed to the sort of um more airy agatha christie-esque stuff that he's doing with um benoit blanc uh he's got a star wars film he's got uh the the brothers bloom which is uh honestly feels kind of Wes Anderson-y in some ways in the like the magic of the world that they exist in uh, and then Looper which is just like this kind of gritty sci-fi film but all of those films to me still feel like Ryan Johnson They're, the the way he writes and constructs his stories uh, has a very distinct style yeah, I uh, I will let you know. And I don't want to make this about Ryan Johnson, but I have also enjoyed all of the films that I've seen by him. I would maybe say that for the casual film goer, his style isn't as recognizable as Wes Anderson, and that's obviously because of you know things like framing sure. and color and like the his ensemble casts, right? But once again, like Ryan Johnson certainly has a, uh, or I guess Wes Anderson has a ten year. Uh, head start on Ryan Johnson with regards to you know the distance between his feature his uh, first film you know so Brick I know sure. came out in 2005 Wes Anderson's Bottle Rocket came out in 1996 so who knows maybe in nine ten years time we'll be looking back and thinking like oh, okay Ryan Johnson is in this class of uh, film filmmakers you know that we had just sort of uh, outlined previously. I wonder too, and, and this is going to be my last comment on this subject because you're right, this is, we're not talking about Ryan Johnson, but I feel like his style is more expressed through story, whereas Wes Anderson's is very visual, right? So to a casual uh, film goer, as you say, it's a lot more immediately recognizable that you are looking at a Wes Anderson frame. 
Correct. Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, well put. Um, so Wes Anderson, middle name Wales, connecting to Roald Dahl, uh, Ooh, was yeah. born in Houston, Texas, 1969. So he's 54 years old, currently still making films. In fact, this earlier this year, he released uh, his 11th feature film, Asteroid City. Uh, so Asteroid City uh, debuted over the summer. Um, did you get a chance to watch this, Zach? Have you had a chance to see it? I have it? not seen it yet. No. Have you? I did. I watched it once uh, in theaters and enjoyed it, uh, but certainly left the film thinking that may be the most Wes Anderson movie I've ever seen in my entire life. It is. What, is, what does a, that mean? It's He just really jumped into his bag. Like, he had an ensemble cast. I mean, I think that you may have seen the poster or the uh, the trailer for the film that just includes a long list of well-established uh, celebrities and uh, that just goes on uh, past into the double digits, right? Like, sure. few directors have the ability to get someone like Jeff Goldblum to make a cameo appearance, right? Like, just for, yeah. just, just for, just for fun, right? So he's definitely someone who has built up a relationship with many uh, well-known and widely celebrated actors in Hollywood and uh, across the world. Um, but in addition to the ensemble cast, right, he, it is a uh, layered, right? So it, it opens up as a, if I'm if I remember correctly, like a television broadcast of a play that references the playwright. And then, and then like what we see for the majority of the film is the the play itself being like acted out in hmm. you know, uh on a on a on a set in the middle of the, in the middle of nowhere right so uh it is complicated it's complex with its within its structure and so i think given what we've said about uh the wonderful story of henry sugar with which includes like a story within a story within a story there's a reason why someone like wes anderson was drawn to that as a as a project yeah that makes sense I, I mean also to to me the india connection is something that makes sense that wes anderson was drawn to i know he he likes that part of the world or he likes at least uh telling stories or showing stories from that part of the world yeah um and you know i guess you know we'll sort of open up this is the the first time that i've seen a film by him that is not a feature film you know it, it has a runtime of 39 minutes so really accessible i mean if you enjoy wes anderson films i think logging onto netflix and throwing this on um is a good use of your time i enjoyed the adaptation i think that it was you know in many ways uh just very it's like you know if you didn't want to immerse yourself into a feature film you're interested in getting to west into west anderson's work um this is like a perfect starter pack <laughs> you know it has five sure. well-known uh actors a um definitely some remarkable framing and the use of choreography and, and dialogue um but i guess i just want to hear your opening um I guess takes on the film. What? How did you feel about it as you were watching it? I was uh, surprised, and yeah, I'm going to say surprised at how strictly faithful of an adaptation it was. Yes, uh, and how much of it was word for word from the book. Right? I, I mean, it, it was like you could almost put it on put a blanket over your television and just pretend you listen to an audiobook of this short story. That's exactly it, right. Yeah, um, I, I felt... Even to to the point of having like Richard Ayoade's character saying, I said, after he, he says something, right? Uh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. I, uh, I really want to get to the details of the film. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, it was, yeah, the, the the how faithful it is to the adaptation is actually it was very very unique, and I thought that it actually kind of worked well with this type of story. Um, as you know, it may seem sort of sort of jarring to sort of have the dialogue and then also the attributions to like what is being said, um, especially like in film. But as you know, the story went along, you kind of just in, enjoyed it. You know, um, I. So the the five main actors that appear in the film are Ray Fiennes, who plays uh, Roald Dahl, 
and a policeman. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays the titular Henry Sugar, and also at the end, towards the end, um, plays. Uh, now it's escaping me. I know that he appears at the end as another character, but uh, didn't actually write that down. Do you? Oh, do you I didn't. I didn't realize that he did. Nope. I I totally missed that. Okay. No worries. Um, probably just edit this out then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays the titular Henry Sugar. And then we have Ben Kingsley playing the uh, performer who is able to see through bandages and, uh, you know, is sort of the impetus for Henry trying to acquire this same skill. And then the two doctors are Richard Iwadi and Dev Patel. There are others who are included, but these, I would say, are the main five. And yeah, they are just delightful. You know, I think that, um, you know, these are car- these are actors that I think we all, you know, you and I certainly have uh, an affinity mm-hmm. for. I think, you know, given that your favorite Wes Anderson film is The Grand Budapest Hotel, it was kind of, it was maybe nice to see Ray Fiennes uh, appear once again as a, sort of a, a lead, if, uh, if you would, in, in, a, in a Wes Anderson film. Did you feel that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also thought it was very funny. Uh, you read earlier the description of Henry Sugar and uh, applying that to Benedict Cumberbatch just did a giggle for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Man, he has strikingly blue eyes. I, uh, <laughs> it was true. It was, uh, it was uh, something I definitely noted. Wes's ability to adapt a story like this uh, and make it work, I thought was really interesting given how he presented it. You know, we've talked about the dialogue, but also it, it felt a very much like a play, you know, with moving sets. The totally. characters kind of either stood still or walked towards the camera or stayed within the center of the frame the entire time. And you would have these backdrops that sort of like lower themselves or uh, emerge from the sides. Um, and it, I thought it really worked. I think one of the more um, impressive uh choices that i saw was when there's the uh levitation scene so within the story mm. okay, i know that you've already touched on the synopsis of that story a little bit but as the uh the doctor so we're, we're going to embed ourselves in the story within the story within the story the uh the doctor uh goes and meets with the man who is able to see through uh the these, these various barriers. Okay. We should probably actually reference the character name specifically, just so. Um, yeah, this you know, really this cool. is like one of the few uh, differences, right? They changed his name in the film, and I don't know why. Do you know why they did that? No. Do you remember the name? Let's take a. Yeah, in in the book, it's Imrit Khan, and I know because I just looked it up. Yeah. Uh, and in the in the film, they they only say his name a couple times, but it's Imdad Khan, I believe. Huh. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a like a language significance um, or or a cultural significance that this spurred that change or 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 why that would happen. But I was curious, and I I hoped you would know. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I should have should have recognized that. Yeah, Um, yeah, something to maybe look up. Do you want to get on that? Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll look that up while you continue to uh, to tell this story. Okay. Um, so anyway, the the, the doctor uh, named Doctor Marshall in the book, at least. Hopefully, no other character names were adapted, and we have to wait not waste time, but spend time looking into those various changes. He speaks with uh, Imrat Khan about you know how he acquired this talent. Okay, and so then Imrat Khan tells him. A story about as a child, you know, he wants to master certain yogi powers, um, in which he went. He eventually finds himself in the middle of the jungle, where he essentially spies on a yogi who is able to levitate off the ground. Um, and after the yogi finds him, you know, sees him spying on him, he uh, gets very angry um, and throws a rock at him and injures. Uh, Imran Khan, he feels really bad about this because yogis are not supposed to react with such an emotion. Um, and so he, he says that he, he won't take on Imran Khan as an apprentice, which is something that he really wants, but will instead, you know, inform, tell him what 
he needs to do. And that is essentially to focus and to clear his mind to really focus on one specific image. And if he can train himself to do this, he will, in, a, in essence, gain uh, additional abilities, which for him is the ability to see through, um, see straight through solid objects. Um, but anyway, getting back and that's, to... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting again, because that is actually a story change. Uh, also in, in the book to the movie, right? Where in the mm-hmm. book, um, that that yogi never really apologizes. He just says, go go talk to this other guy. And the other guy is the one who teaches him. And I totally understand why they cut that because it is like that is a character that does not need to exist in this story. The, the other yogi who actually does teach uh, Imrush Khan. Correct. Um, yeah. So definitely, like, you know, within the 39-minute runtime, I think it's impressive how much of the story is actually included. We talked about the faithful adaptation, but there are going to be certain things that get omitted, you know, and I think that that being, you know, a pretty unnecessary bit of uh, storytelling, as you just pointed out, or an unnecessary character, it's fine that that was your mm-hmm. um, Anyway, getting back to, uh, we're getting, and I think I'm getting embedded within the podcast or um Uh, getting even better with my own thinking. But Wes Anderson, the uh, choreography, the framing, the way that the sets are organized, the use of the box to simulate levitation, I thought was really clever. And I think that I really appreciate his use of practical effects. Um, You know, obviously, that would have quite easily, you know, we can, you could make somebody levitate off the ground with uh, CGI. But, you know, the deliberate choice to just have this painted box to have a character sit on and then you rotate it to sort of end the, uh, you know, the, the simulation of levitation, I thought was was really endearing and I enjoyed it. And I'm curious to hear yeah. how you reacted to his use of practical effects throughout the film and the, the moving sets as I had sort of outlined earlier. Yeah, it you know, it really added to the feeling of it being a stage play, which you had mentioned earlier. Uh, and not just with the backdrops sort of changing themselves, but occasionally you would even see extras who are playing the role of like stagehands, right? Who would be moving things on or off of quote unquote set um, or stage, I guess is what I meant to say, but set is the movie term. So Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was just like, that's how you would do that. If it was a stage play, you would use the box. Uh, So yeah, I, I thought it was cool. I liked it. Um, I also want to briefly mention that Dr. Marshall yeah. um, was, I believe, the correct name, but the journal was in the book written by a Dr. Cartwright, and they changed that in the film to be Dr. Chatterjee. Um, and, and I think that one is probably more easily explainable as in like, Maybe we don't need it to be a, a white colonialist, and maybe it can actually just be an Indian doctor. For sure, yeah. And that uh, that Dr. Dr. Chatterjee in the film played uh, by Dave Patel. Dave Patel. Dave, mm-hmm. Dave, Dave Patel. Dave Patel. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, uh, Dev Patel. Um, yeah, I you know I think the other thing that I really enjoyed about a Wes Anderson film, and you in, enjoy this with all of his work, right, is just sort of the the very fast and snappy dialogue that doesn't go over one's head. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, again, as we sort of mentioned earlier, that the attributions to the quotes being like, you know, Doctor Marshall didn't answer; his whole face was rigid with shocked disbelief. You know, like some that that sort of um, intonation and cadence, I think. Uh, is is another one of his hallmarks, right? Um, that specific totally. example too, like having the character Richard Iwadi just be like walking and then look back in shock disbelief is just so funny. That was a great moment. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think maybe the best moment in the in that section of the film. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, that you thought so as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think uh, Ben Kingsley uh, being the uh, actor to portray. Um, Imran Khan was, uh, you know, now that I've seen the film, it's like, okay, well, nobody else could have played that. You know, obviously he won an Academy Award for his portrayal of Gandhi many, many years ago. Um, so mm-hmm. having him return as, you know, this enlightened Indian figure, I suppose, in the context of the story, um, only 
really makes sense uh, for the film. So I think another benefit of having Wes, Wes Anderson uh, is able, his ability to draw from such a wide and acclaimed uh, selection of performers uh, really benefits the story. Totally. Yeah, very, very much agreed. Um, and, and also, I guess that's a story change, which seems to be my role in this podcast is pointing out when things are, are different, uh, is that Ben Kingsley is much, much older than the character is in the book, who I believe was uh, made out to be in his late 20s or early 30s, uh, but very young, and which makes his death feel all the more tragic because of how young he is. Did you notice that also? You know, Zach, um, I had unfortunately forgotten, uh, <laughs> but uh, because I had read the read the story several weeks ago and then watched the film last night, but I should have uh, sure. done my due diligence and maybe read the story one more time. But I'm glad that you're here. It, you know, this is this is a it's a it's a tag team effort. So I appreciate you being yeah. here. To correct correct me as we embark on this. Uh, Fun well, it's not correcting you. We're we're discussing. I mean, that's what we're doing here. We're comparing and contrasting. And uh, I happened to read the story and watch the film maybe two days apart, so it was all fresh in my mind. Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad. Um, thank you again. Um, so yeah, in the uh, in the film, sort of getting let's get to sort of the the end of the narrative, I suppose. Very much like in the the story, the Raul Dahl, the Raul Dahl's written story. Um, Henry Sugar reads this uh, information about you know the this, this the, the doctor's retelling of the uh, Imran Khan's um, process and how he gained those abil- the ability to see through solid matter and he says okay I'm going to use this to my advantage to uh, essentially win as much money as I possibly can at casinos right so this is very similar to what happens in the story and. He trains for many years to be able to, if a card pops up, <clears throat> he is able to recognize what it is uh, before, you know, um, he is asked to say it. So before it's, it's dealt. Yeah. So, yeah, he, so he can see through the top card of the deck and then play blackjack and know what he's going to get. And thus essentially always know whether or not he's going to win or lose. Exactly right. And so then, as we pointed out earlier, you know, his great character transformation is that he, once he has acquired this ability, um, he's gone through a transformation. He is no longer um, interested in acquiring so much money. Um, there's a scene, uh, I don't know if the, the front cover of your book had this, but the front cover of my book has Henry Sugar just throwing money from a balcony. Uh, and so... You know, we get to that moment in the story in which he takes this large stack of money, 50 pound notes in the movie and is throwing them off the balcony at various passersby. And um, a policeman comes to his door and says, you know, you can't do this. You're an idiot. You should be donating money to hospitals and orphanages rather than just throwing it off and causing a riot, throwing it off your balcony and causing a riot. And he then has this idea in which he will. You know, as you outlined at the beginning of the podcast, he's going to disguise himself, go around the world and visit many different casinos in which he will attain as much money as possible, stash that money in a Swiss bank, and then have that be, you know, funneled to the create so to um, a corporation in which he can then build various hospitals and orphanages. So the story ends, Henry Sugar has passed away, and um that that is essentially the it. Um, am I missing anything there, Zach? No. Um, uh, this brings me to another one of the differences I wanted to to talk about, which is in the novella. There is kind of a decent section, like there's more telling of how Henry Sugar does that, and we even get a couple little anecdotes about his times in Vegas. Uh, whereas the the short film really just summarizes that he does this and doesn't spend any time actually exploring the doing of it. Uh, And and to me, that also makes sense as a story change. Um, It it didn't really make sense to go to these new locations. And, uh, you, you know, when you think about the form of a short story or a short film, it tends to be 
about one sort of realization that the main character has, right? And that's the growth moment that we, it's not like a, a personality transformation, it's a realization. And by then in the story, we've already gotten that realization from Henry Sugar. He knows he wants to give to orphanages. So the actual doing of it is more like epilogue uh, than actual body to the story. Uh, do, do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think by the time that we had reached that point in the film, um, we were certainly on a ready, like ready to wind down. You know, there was a, yeah. not really any, any need to have sort of any of that additional, those additional scenes. Um, but, it, I, you know, I, having said that, it's not something I would have disapproved of. Uh, at that point, it was just, it, it, it is always fun, I suppose, in, and I don't know if you feel this way, to see somebody or at least the main character win and succeed in like the thing that they're doing, particularly when that thing is like beating casinos. I don't know. I find that incredible. Yeah, for charity. Yeah. Yeah. And those were some of the most fun pages in the book uh, or in the novella uh, as well. So I wouldn't have been mad had they been included, but I understand why from a story perspective uh, you could call them extraneous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, why, why do you think Wes Anderson chose to adapt this story? Well, I think you've kind of answered that question already um, through, throughout the podcast. You've mentioned his attachment to nested narratives. You've mentioned um, his attachment to Roald Dahl. Uh, and briefly, which I think we should get further into, uh, and I guess I mentioned his attachment to South Asia so it, it seems like adding all of these elements into one story makes it almost like bait for Wes Anderson. Totally. Yeah, no, I, 100%. I, I guess I meant more sort of like, does this, is this just an enjoyable adaptation of the story? Is, you know, does Wes Anderson have anything more to say? Uh, this is not an Asteroid City podcast, but I do feel like given that the film came out this year, it should be mentioned that I think, you know, the film while incredibly complex at the end of the day is about, you know, how do we reckon with sort of our position in the world, given that the film, you know, we have um, not to spoil, if this is going to be a spoiler of Asteroid City, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, including maybe you, Zach, so maybe I should just stop talking. But uh, True, I um, haven't seen it, so. I will yeah. stop talking then, I yeah. It's about, it, you it's know, a, yeah. It's a shame because I'm sure it was going to be an interesting thought. So, so maybe try and despoilerize it as much as you can. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, it, it, it has us confronting humanity and ourselves in the world. At least that's what I took away from it. So I am curious to know, to, I'm curious to know if you felt that Wes adapting the story in 2023 was trying to say anything more or do you think he was just you know he just sat down and thought i enjoy reading this story i think people will enjoy seeing this story and it was just a matter of producing uh, a fun piece of entertainment for you know uh, maybe the netflix audience yeah i, I mean I, the themes are certainly relevant the the themes of giving to others. You mentioned uh, in your description of Henry Sugar that it is very topical in this, the year 2023, to criticize the aimlessly wealthy um, or, or really the wealthy in general. That's, you know, I, I don't know that Wes Anderson adds anything to that theme work that wasn't in the original, but it, it's certainly topical. And I can see reading this and thinking, yeah, let's let's bring this to more audiences right now in this this cultural moment. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it does. I um, yeah. I, again, I think as I maybe mentioned earlier, I, uh, I I was just wondering whether that sort of final resolution of like, oh, you know, like wealthy people just donating more of their money is the solution. I you know I, I don't know how he could have like expanded upon that that was the one thing that like personally you know i maybe don't don't see as sort of the 
the answer to all the world's woes. Not that it can be simplified in any way like that, but I'm curious to know, as you, you know, who which we share similar um, political beliefs, um, if you felt that way, at least with the film. I know that, as you have mentioned earlier, with the, the story, it's uh, maybe not worth reading into it that much, but given that, you know, it is a yeah. contemporary adaptation. Uh, if, if that's something that you, you know, butt it up again. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a very, I, I just looked and this was originally published in 1977 and that's a very 1977 take, right? Um, to to say that like, okay, well, you know, it's fine if if there are wealthy people out there, but if they use their ability to generate wealth for good, then that would that would help. And that's still true. It would help. I don't think it's an ultimate solution to anything. Um, and it feels... I wasn't alive in 1977, but it feels hollow today. And I would imagine it maybe didn't feel quite as hollow in 1977. Um, For sure. I think it's it's very Adam Smith, right? <laughs> like the yeah charity uh, was sort of the, the answer. Like, and also that like well, very wealthy people will just be naturally compelled to do this, right? Is uh, right uh, maybe some a big flaw from what we've seen over the last fifty years since the story's been published. And yeah, um, well put. How, how do you think, Russell? How could Wes Anderson have uh, altered? this story in order to change that uh that gap in the i guess the moral of it um well i think firstly you know when the uh, policeman shows up to sort of reprimand him he could have taken the 50 pound note away from him because we defund the police on this podcast uh this <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay. Thank you. First of all, very good. Please uh, continue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the uh, uh, I'm actually not sure. You know, I, I just you know, for all intents and purposes, I I think it would be a very challenging thing to do. Um, and so I, I don't really know if I have the answers to that. I, I suppose I think I maybe would have adapted the um, the. Uh, <clears throat> The target of the philanthropy, okay, like hospitals and orphanages, maybe maybe expand upon that a little bit, you know, and mm. or or maybe mm. you know do something to. Well, they did though, because it's it's just orphanages in the book, isn't it? Oh, it might be. And they added hospitals uh, in the in the film. I, I'm fairly certain that's correct. Okay. Yeah, I I guess I don't know. Maybe I, I maybe just. You know, he, he may be doing something in which, I don't know, you know, maybe ed- education, something that's sort of done to sort of benefit people beyond just sort of, uh, you know, care, which is obviously a very important and uh, shelter, I guess, for children. But I don't know. Uh, did you did you have an answer to this? I feel like I'm stumbling along here. No, I, and I don't really think there is one. I think it's inherent to the story, right? Like the the protagonist is a wealthy man who is obsessed with uh, attaining additional wealth. And then once he has reached his goal of obtaining additional wealth or being able to obtain additional wealth, realizes, "Eh, maybe I don't want this. I'll just give it away instead, which isn't a way to enact real systemic change in any way. Uh, and, and that's fine. It's it's not yeah. a political treatise. It's a it's a story of a personal realization, as all short stories are, or or many are, I guess. Yeah, I guess the uh, the other thing to mention as we sort of bring this conversation to a close is the decision to include Roald Dahl as a character within the film. So, as you may know, Roald Dahl. Uh, it's been recently has come under fire for um, insensitive remarks uh, and varying from just sort of the descriptions of uh, you know characters in his story to outright outright anti-Semitism. And so you uh-huh. know I, I'm curious you know as we mentioned uh, Wes Anderson's 
use of the story embedded within the story embedded within the story nested storytelling as you put it um you know the the, the movie opens up with Raul Dahl himself right um and you know i i can I, i'm curious to to know if, if you've looked into that controversy at all i've heard a little bit about it but i haven't delved deeply um so you're you're almost certainly more informed than i am what what was your take it didn't bother me having Raul Dahl in the film um i I'm, I wonder if it was, if the controversy had, I, I imagine that the film was made before the controversy really became popular, you know, popularized in the media. But essentially, sure. you know, I think the the big thing here is that a lot of people who pushed back against sort of the, uh, okay, so just to provide some context, as mentioned earlier, Raul Dahl has had some insensitive remarks and then outright racism and anti-Semitism in his history, something that is perhaps unsurprising, given that he was a, you know, a, a white British man in the uh, mid to 20th century. Um, however, you know, as we have mentioned at the top of the podcast, his books are still widely beloved. And so there has been a push to... Uh, edit some of these remarks out so for example rather than calling calling a character fat you know you may call a character large or enormous something like that you know so definitely uh -huh. um yeah just and then you know obviously that applies as well to uh racial descriptions and various other things so the the backlash sure. to that is that you know why should we censor Raul Dahl's work and i think that really the um the point here is that people aren't really upset that the work is being censored. I think maybe some people are, and, but it's more so people have these emotional attachments to this author, myself included. And I think the people who see that, you know, they see his work being criticized. They view that as a criticism of themselves, right? Like, oh, you know, I hmm. love this book and now you're trying to take that away from me. It's less so much about the enjoyment of the story or sort of like a, I said, a more sensitive depiction of all people so that everybody can enjoy the story, right? Um, yeah. We see uh, people pushing up against that. And it is curious to me that, you know, many people who will, you know, will say, will will look at Raul Dahl and say like how can you you know censor him you know that is it's wrong you know don't be so uh this is like you know i guess you know wokeness you know be going to an extreme um and on the other hand those same people might look at contemporary literature that highlights the experiences of uh queer and uh you know queer folks and folks who are people of color and think like oh well we can't have that in our schools you know what i mean it, there's a there's definitely totally. some sort of cognitive dissonance there um that's that's just uh something to highlight i again i think that as an english teacher i think that i don't i don't want any works you know censored or barred from students having access to but i do think that um you know these these mild ad uh, addendums to the book the make sure that you know all students can enjoy them isn't isn't bad i don't know I, I i specifically with this sort of literature right because how much can you yeah. as a child uh understand this in context right can a, an eight-year-old be like okay i'm reading this insensitive character description now do i have the critical thinking ability to understand that Raul Dahl as like a white man in the 20th century may have had some complicated views on uh, other people in the world and then i don't know if the answer is yes you know and maybe that's something to learn later in life but uh yeah i guess yeah. Yeah, i just what do you think i i mean i i agree with you to to me like editing character descriptions like adjective stuff that doesn't change the story and that's not why i hope 
anybody loved Roald Dahl. It's certainly not why like I enjoyed reading his books as a kid. It wasn't because of the insensitive ways he described his characters. It was because the stories were good and the the narrative arcs, the character growth, uh, all felt good and resonated. But none of that relied upon those descriptive words that uh, my understanding is are what coming under fire, that sentence got off the rails, but I think you understood uh, what I was saying. Yeah. Um, but, and, and so that's like, to me, that's barely even censorship. You're not changing the ideas, right? Uh, that are essential to the work. Where it, and it's, and, it, you know, that can be different on, in different books, like Huck Finn is one that comes up a lot. And uh, I don't want to get into it here, but that's a much more complicated conversation because the the insensitivity is the point of the book right totally yeah 100 all right so well uh maybe this is a good opportunity and we saw that wait i'm sorry i'm going to continue uh we even saw that kind of change in the in wes anderson's adaptation making uh, like with the the doctor's name and presumably changing those doctors to people of color as opposed to what were pretty clearly to me in the in the novella white British colonialists who were the doctors there um, and that didn't like it didn't change the story at all it it had no no bearing on it yeah no uh, again Richard Iwadi and Dave Patel doing really good work. Dave Patel, good old Dave Patel. <laughs> doing really good work in, uh, <laughs> in West Anderson's adaptation. Uh, if by some miracle, uh, Dev Patel ends up listening to this, Dev, huge fan of your work. Love you. Um, but yeah, sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier in the podcast. Um, <laughs> with, with that, Zach, uh, Thank you for doing this, my friend. Um, I think that it should be noted that we came up with this idea together um, while hanging out in person over the summer in New Zealand, of all places, which was really, really cool. Whoa, whoa, whoa. wait. Did we not oh. think of this in South Africa? Maybe we did. Never mind. I, I think we did. And it's just taken us months to actually get here. But I, I seem to remember this coming up in maybe even in the car ride to the airport as I was leaving after spending a, a month in, in the lovely city of Cape Town. That's right. God, what is happening to me? I'm approaching 30 and I'm losing all my short term. Yeah, you As are. As if you had it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <no>. Us. <laughs> uh, yes, you are right because we watched. Okay, so uh, if if you are somehow still listening to this and not um, our parents, <laughs> uh, then uh, what, what happened was we had watched High Fidelity, which is a movie that you really enjoyed and one that I hadn't seen. We watched that in South Africa mm-hmm. like eight months ago. Uh, yep. And uh, we thought, oh, like Nick, this is based off a Nick Hornby novel. We should read that book. And then, as you said, we had the, the, the topic of why don't we do a podcast about the, the book uh, versus the film? We're like, yeah, that's a great idea. We're totally going to do that. Um, and now here we are talking about a completely different book and uh, film, uh, but I'm, I'm yeah. so glad to have to have done it. So I hope that we get this is do, a lot of fun. I hope we get to do another one. I'm sure we will. We can we can make it happen. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I'm very eager to to do this again. It was a very enjoyable experience, uh, and really the history of this idea goes back so much farther because you and I have over the last. Uh, I don't know, I don't know two or three years repeatedly had conversations about uh, book to film adaptations we either very much liked or very much disliked. It became a, a popular question whenever we're hanging out with like not a new group of people but people who we haven't had the conversation with. Like, what is your favorite and your least favorite uh, film adaptation of a book? So uh, it's been really nice to get to actually dive deeper into one instance of that we even we even read and watched gone girl which i think would be an interesting episode of this podcast a long time ago yeah no absolutely um 
Oh God, if only I could remember the hilarious quote from the book right now to drop. But as I said, my short term memory for some reason is lapsing. So uh, we'll come back. Um, and I look forward to doing this to you again. Yeah. So uh, thanks everybody who, who has listened to this and thank you. If you've ever had a conversation about books and film with us, you, you know, who you are. Yeah. We'll, we'll be back with uh, potentially an, another episode at some point. So subscribe and like, and do all of the internet things that you have to do for any content you like these days in order to allow the people who make that content to continue making it because Really, we all just serve algorithms and uh, analytics dashboards these days.